Many vegan activists are pushing you to eat a more plant-based diet because it's purportedly better for the planet. Let's review that claim and draw upon evidence from a recent paper titled Animal Board Invited Review, Animal Sourced Foods in Healthy, Sustainable, and Ethical Diets, an Argument Against Drastic Limitations of Livestock in the Food System. So it turns out that the notion that all animal source foods are bad for the planet actually is a little bit more contextualized. It's not so binary or black or white. It turns out that the practices, it's practice specific. So if we look at feedlots compared to regeneratively raised, raised cattle, we've reviewed some of those studies and I can link some of those there. Uh, we have many comparison studies finding that the nutritional components of Feedlot cattle versus pasture-raised grass-fed cattle is completely different, but the impact on the planet is also different as well. So these investigators do talk about how there are agricultural methods that can be detrimental, such as deforestation, uh, overgrazing, cropping for feed, but this is not necessarily intrinsic to animal husbandry. The same thing happens for uh, plant-sourced foods as well. Think about palm, for example. I don't want you to Google this because it might uh, harm some of your well-being, but the orangutan uh, population in Malaysia and Indonesia uh, are really suffering from the deforestation to uh, plant palm, and these animals are burned alive, right? So this idea that if you go on a, on a a plant-based diet that no animals will be harmed uh, is actually not true. The USDA has pretty good data to show how many hogs, how many hawks, how many snakes, how many voles, how many mice, how many birds uh, and deer are inadvertently killed for the uh, growing of corn, soy, and all these commodity crops. We don't like to talk about that, but that's the reality of the situation. No matter what is grown, uh, animals are dying. And so we, it's really you know sort of like, well, so we don't care about all the voles, all the hawks, all the snakes, all the pigs that are all, that are killed. There's hundreds of thousands of pigs that are killed uh, in the South, um, not for me, but just because they will uh, come in and, and eat the corn or eat the soy. And so the USDA allows these animals to be slaughtered. And so we, you know, vegans never talk about that, but this this happens all the time. And so um, in this paper, they, they talk about this, how you know, it really depends on the practice specifics and the specificities of how these animals are raised and the fact that animal death is not zero when it comes to eating plant source foods. But they talk about the benefits. This is, I think, really lost in the conversation, the benefits of upcycling of micronutrients. The ruminants can take an inedible grass and grain type product and convert that into edible protein. And actually, if they're doing this in a regenerative grass-fed open pasture manner, they can actually sequester carbon back into the soil out of the atmosphere. So it's a net negative. But what I think is really interesting is the nutritional aspect here. So in figure one, this is the portion size needed to achieve the average 33% requirements for iron, vitamin A, zinc, folate, and B12. From ruminant liver, you just need one gram compared to 500 over a pound of oranges over a pound of carrots, uh, almost a pound of avocados, bell peppers, pumpkins, and so on. So when it comes to a micronutrition comparison, head-to-head -head comparing liver, eggs, ruminant meat versus dark leafy greens, or as I mentioned, oranges, carrots, avocados. I mean, I love avocados, by the way. I'm nothing wrong with carrots, but we just know that it's not a great source of micronutrition compared to, say, a ruminant liver or ruminant meat or eggs, right? So when we're comparing micronutrients, we need way more plant-sourced foods, which, again, we know plant-sourced foods are not totally absolved of, of animal cruelty or inadvertent animal death, you know? And so that's something to consider. But this figure here, we're going to talk about figure two in a moment uh, and talk about how the difference in the carbon equivalence of going on a plant-sourced diet versus an omnivorous-style diet and how other things that we consume all the time, uh, such as, you know, having a house, uh, having going on trips on airplanes or driving a car or buying iPhones or iPads or things like that impact the planet. Uh, and the carbon equivalents and so on. But I first just want to thank you for being here. If you're enjoying the content, hit that like button. Be sure to share this video with a friend because we're about to dive into some really interesting science. Now, since it's the new year, I do want to remind you about a tool that can help improve your exercise efficiency, strength, and performance, as well as support healthy hydration. This is the novel Electrolyte Sticks by Myoscience, one of the only high-potency creatine monohydrate products paired with electrolytes to enhance the cellular absorption and uptake of creatine and also simultaneously support healthy hydration. 
as you know, creatine's all the rage. Uh, the New York Magazine just put out a big piece on creatine. While uh, Women's Health Magazine just put out another piece on creatine, how creatine actually disproportionately benefits women because women don't store as much creatine in their muscles compared to men. So women should actually be taking creatine. Uh, lots of health benefits beyond just muscle. But um, one of the things that you might find over at Myoscience, there's over 1,800 reviews on the novel creatine containing electrolytes. What's unique about this, my friends, is most of the creatine on the market is sourced from China. It's not very clean, not very good, doesn't mix well. Uh, we source creatine from Germany, known as Crea Pure. And what's unique about this is you're getting two and a half grams of creatine per serving paired with electrolytes to enhance the absorption and the health benefits. So you, you can see what other people are saying over at myoscience.com or save with the code podcast at checkout over at myoscience.com. I'll put links in the description below. Okay, so let's get back to the study here. As I mentioned, we're going to really dive into some really interesting stuff uh, because you know the big push here is well, we gotta, we gotta, we all need to go on a plant based diet because it's purportedly better for the planet. Well, it turns out that a round trip flight consumes way more carbon equivalents compared to uh, eating animal source food. So if if you're you know, jet setting around the world, going to a yoga retreat in Costa Rica, and then a meditation retreat in Sedona, uh, and you're eating a plant-based diet. Well, uh, you know, those uh, jet setting is is really going to be harmful for the planet, but no one says anything about commercial travel. We do that all the time. What about having a car? Well, it turns out that having a car contributes significantly to carbon emissions. What about you know, consumer goods, buying clothes that are made in Vietnam, even though you live in North America? Or what about your tablet? Or what about just aimlessly scrolling on Instagram or TikTok? I mean, those servers have to be cooled down. They contribute to deforestation. They consume a lot of energy uh, and greenhouse gases, but we never hear about well, don't aimlessly scroll on TikTok because it's bad for the planet. We hear that you shouldn't eat that terrible red meat because it's bad for the planet. But, you know, if we look at the difference between a plant-based diet versus a, a vegetarian or flexi flexitarian diet, the carbon equivalence, it, it's pretty insignificant compared to other ways that we can reduce our carbon emissions, you know, from housing to uh, even the the healthcare, the U.S. healthcare system uh, contributes to about, I want to say it's about 20% of greenhouse gases here in the U.S., whereas animal sourced foods is like less than 1%. So why aren't we talking about making people healthy? If we just had less dependence, as Sean Baker has talked about for almost a decade now, if we were less dependent upon the U.S. healthcare system, we could dramatically reduce uh, greenhouse gas and single waste plastic use. I mean, when you go to the doctor, think about all the sheets and the towels and the uh, scrubs and the gloves and just all the stuff that just gets wasted for every patient visit for people that are suffering from diet induced chronic diseases. Like we should be really focusing on exercise and all that if we care about the planet. But that being said, I mean, this chart really highlights how red meat and dairy and all this, uh, they're not contributing significantly to greenhouse gas uh, emissions compared to other things that we use all the time. We drive cars uh, everywhere. People you know, use their iPads and their iPhones and, and things like that. So I think that's interesting. Also, when we think about the micronutrition uh, aspect of it and how protein and various micronutrients found from ruminant meat or ruminant liver or eggs, you know, those are going to contribute to greater whole health and reduce the prevalence of, of these non-communicable diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, dementia, depression, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, kidney disease, I mean, sleep apnea, the list goes on. Because when we look at the studies here, uh, most of the epidemiological studies uh, really don't show that unprocessed red meat is significantly contributing to these non-communicable diseases. There's all sorts of confounding variables and healthy user bias that when adjusted for don't show that red meat is contributing to these deleterious conditions. Uh, we see it's more the processed red meat and the junk food. And so we should not be endorsing junk food consumption, be encouraging people to eat whole omnivorous style foods. And again, this paper goes into really great detail, uh, talking about all these confounding variables and how there's really not good justification to show that eating unprocessed, whole, pasture-raised, grass-fed, ruminant flesh uh, is contributing to ill health. So I think this is really important that we understand that the liver 
and the flesh from ruminant animals contains far more micronutrients, far more essential amino acids and health promoting compounds than equal amounts of plant sourced foods. And even if you do go on a vegan or vegetarian diet, you know, if you're traveling, if you're buying new clothes, iPads, computers, you know, scrolling on Instagram and social media and using all the data from all these different, you know, servers and so forth, that's still contributing to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So there's other ways that we can reduce uh, the, you know, and support the planet without having to compromise your health in the meantime. So we should focus on pra practice specificity, meaning that if you're, you know, be part of the solution, not part of the problem, go to the grocery store, you know, buy grass fed, pasture raised uh, animal products, try not to support as much, you know, feedlot cattle or feedlot uh, chicken or a hog production, you know, try to go to the source, go to the, a local rancher, go to a farmer's market, befriend a rancher, I think that's the, the path forward and we should all be uh, supporting that financially so that we uh, incentivize more and more people, more and more ranchers and farmers to um, implement those sort of practices and strategies. So uh, really good paper. If you want to dive into it, I'll put links in the description below. As always, friends, I'm grateful that you are tuning in. We'll catch you on a future episode down the road.